I was 15 years old on a road trip with my family, a long road trip, winding through the interior of BC and down the coast. And the plan was to end at a place just 40 minutes north of here called Anvil Island, where my aunt and uncle were building a cabin. And during this long road trip, I very quickly ran out of things to do. And in my state of perpetual boredom, I did something I would never have done otherwise. I picked up one of my father's books. It was this one, a book about string theory. At the time, I was certain that I was destined for a life in filmmaking. I had no interest in science whatsoever, but in my desperation, I read this book. I read it cover to cover in that car on that trip, and I finished it just as we arrived at the cabin. So, when I read that book, I have to say I was completely entranced by the ideas, and it must have been written all over my face because when we got to the cabin, my aunt asked me what it was about. You see, string theory is really rather simple. It says that all of our favorite particles—electrons, photons, whatever—are not just different dots in space, but one-dimensional strings. And all the strings are the same, except they can be open or closed. The only thing that distinguishes the different particles are the different vibrational patterns of these strings. In fact, one of the simplest patterns you can make from the closed string is gravity. This is a quantum theory of gravity. Anyways, this is probably a little less muddled version of what I told my aunt at the time. But ever the pragmatist, she said, "So what? <laughs> what does that mean for the real world?" It's not going to help me set up plumbing or electricity for my cabin. How could it possibly make my life any easier? And I went, but it's supposed to be the theory of everything. Fortunately, I was not dissuaded by my aunt's words, and I spent the next eight years really trying to understand the ideas in that book. And I'm happy to say that last week I finished a master's thesis in string theory. <laughs> Thanks. It's been a very busy month for me. But if I could go back to that conversation now, I think I would say this: String theory may or may not be the theory of everything, but it might tell you something about your plumbing, and it could very well help with your electrical wiring. You see, in the eight years since that conversation, I've come across again and again and again an overwhelming public perception that the kind of edge of reality research that's done in string theory bears no significance on our lives. And part of the problem is communication. So as soon as I start talking about string theory, I run into a problem of scale. We can wrap our heads around things you can see under a microscope. Maybe you can think about the individual atoms that make up your seat. Or maybe even you're comfortable talking about the subatomic particles that make up those atoms, like the ones collided together at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. This is basically just a giant circular running track for accelerating protons up to really high speeds in order to smash them together. But strings, strings are 10 to the negative 35 meters long. What does that number even mean? It's so small, it's essentially meaningless. So we often use this trick in science where we scale things up in order to give them meaning. So you might have heard something like this in a science class: If an atom were the size of a football field, its nucleus would be a grain of rice at the center. That's nice. It gives you something to visualize, something you can put yourself into. But that kind of trick doesn't work with strings. This number is too small, and the range of scales that humans interact with are such a tiny portion of the available scales of the universe. So physicists have a way around this. We think in terms of energy instead of length. The higher you go in energy, the smaller the length scales you can observe. It's obvious if you think about a rock. You want to look at a rock; it doesn't take much energy. But if you want to look at the individual grains of sand that make up that rock, you have to smash it really hard. And that's exactly what's done at the Large Hadron Collider. This gargantuan achievement that accelerates protons up to energies higher than any other collider in the world, in order to smash them together and see what they're made of. But here's something you probably didn't know about this thing: the entire energy contained in those collisions is about the same as the kinetic energy of an ant going for a stroll. I just made it seem a lot less monumental, but of course, what's impressive is that all that energy is contained into individual particles. But now we can ask, what would be the energy required to observe a string? It's about the same as the kinetic energy of a bullet train at top speed. It took us 30 years to build the LHC, 
There is no chance in my lifetime of ever observing strings. It's a depressing thought. But this fact has been known since the birth of string theory, since the 70s and 80s, when these, among other great minds, had the audacity to forge ahead and work out the details to a theory they would never observe. That's long-term investment on an unprecedented scale. Because these people knew something that most people don't, and I think many physicists don't, which is that nature does not ignore beautiful theories. It finds a way to make use of them. And sure enough, their efforts are being rewarded. In 1997, this man, Juan Maldacena, discovered a beautiful picture that emerges from string theory. It's called gauge-gravity duality. I'll refer to it as the holographic principle, for reasons you'll see soon. Here's a statement roughly, and then I'll break it down. It says that certain systems of strongly interacting particles in three dimensions are equivalent to classical gravity in four dimensions. What this is, is a duality, a matter of switching perspectives. If we stare at the equations that govern the left side, we see a duck. But if we look at those equations long enough, we realize they're a rabbit. In this case, the duck is a strongly interacting system. That just means that all the individual particles have a very large influence on one another. So these kinds of things come up all the time in nature, from hydrodynamics, the motion of fluids, to the motion of electrons in a wire, or in your computer chips, or even in a superconductor, which I'll talk more about in a minute. But strong interaction is really the bane of physicists' existence, and here's why. Our job is to make predictions send a particle into a system, wait some time, and we try to tell you where it's going to come out, or at least the probability that it will come out at any given location. Sending a particle into a weakly interacting system is like sending your friend down the street to get some milk. Their trajectory might get jostled a bit as they travel, but chances are they're going to end up at the grocery store in a very predictable amount of time. Sending a particle into a strongly interacting system is like throwing your friend into a mosh pit. Good luck trying to predict where or when they're going to come out of that. So these kinds of problems are extremely difficult to work on, and that's what makes the holographic principle so powerful. It says that instead of messing around with billions of particles all shoving each other, all we need to do is think about classical gravity in one extra dimension. Now, the images that should come to mind when I say classical gravity are things like black holes, warps and bends in space and time. And if any of this, um, it might seem a little exotic, but all of it really is fairly simple to work with because the dynamics were written down in 1915 by Albert Einstein in his theory of general relativity. And general relativity is an exotic picture in itself. It says that all matter bends space and time around it, and that moving objects follow those bends in space and time. And if any of this seems a little detached or otherworldly now, imagine how it would have seemed in 1915. And yet, most of us today have a cell phone. And on that cell phone is a GPS. And if it wasn't for the equations written down by Albert Einstein, those GPSs would not be able to stay synchronized with the satellites they relay to, satellites that follow these warps and bends in space and time. In fact, if your phone just stopped accounting for relativity, it would fall out of sync by 10 kilometers a day. That means that if today your phone says you're at UBC, tomorrow it will say you're in Richmond, and next month you'll find yourself in Seattle. <laughs> so, general relativity, black holes, curved spaces, these are now our tools for studying strongly interacting systems. I'm going to try and put this together in a picture, and don't worry if it doesn't make sense, because while a picture is worth a thousand words, an equation is worth a thousand pictures, and what I'm really trying to do is skim the surface of a lot of very complicated equations. But here goes. Take our world, our three dimensions, all of our favorite strongly interacting phenomena, and flatten them down into a surface, and then wrap that surface around a deeper four-dimensional space, this cylinder. At the center of that cylinder is a black hole, and there's gravity inside the cylinder, which I've shown in terms of closed strings. All of our favorite gravity ingredients live inside the cylinder, and all of it is described by string theory, our quantum theory of gravity. And I have to emphasize that just like the picture of the duck and the rabbit, these two things, the systems on the boundary and the stuff in the interior, are the same. They might look totally different, but in this setup, they contain exactly the same information. Just as a hologram projects its information from a two-dimensional slide into three-dimensional space, here, the physics on the boundary project their information into the deeper four-dimensional space. <laughs> 
And there's a whole dictionary that goes with this that tells us which ingredients on the boundary are equivalent to which ingredients in the interior. For example, the size of that black hole tells you what the temperature is on the boundary. How deep into the cylinder you go tells you how smeared out the particles are on the boundary. And in the physics community, this has produced a very unlikely marriage because the stuff on the boundary are studied by people who like to work on what you can put on a tabletop in front of you, and they often make a profit doing so. But the stuff in the interior are studied by string theorists, these sort of ethereal intellects that think in a space that's not quite here and often don't know how to interact with human beings. <laughs> But now, thanks to this duality, you'll often find those two groups hanging out with each other. It's brought string theorists into the real world. So one success story to come of this is fluid dynamics. The motion of fluids are now described completely gravitationally. Even turbulence, all the little eddies in the fluid, are seen in terms of the jitters in space around the black hole. So yes, string theory has something to say about your plumbing. But what about your electronics? And here's where the most promise is held. One of the most exciting possibilities is a theory of warm superconductors. Superconductors are really one of the holy grails of technology. There are these materials we found that, when cooled below a certain temperature, lose all resistance to the flow of electricity. That means that if all of our wiring were made from superconductors, there would be zero energy lost. If our transmission lines were made from superconductors, our energy consumption would drop by six and a half percent. That's the same effect as if Canada, France, Australia, and Iceland all got together and decided to stop using power completely. If you have a laptop, you might have noticed. That sometimes it gets quite hot. That's because the computer chips inside have resistance, and that resistance generates heat. If those chips could be made from superconductors, then manufacturers could pack on more and more transistors onto each chip without worrying about heat, and you get more and more computing power per square inch. The reason we don't have these wonderful things today is because the materials we've found so far to be superconducting only work at very cold temperatures, much colder than you could ever keep your laptop at. But those temperatures are creeping up as more materials are found. The whole phenomenon was discovered by this man, Hike Kamerling Ones. In 1911, he found it by cooling mercury down to minus 270 degrees Celsius. And I can only imagine how alien that temperature regime would have seemed to the public then. How meaningless that number would have looked. But then, 60 years later, the MRI machine was invented. MRIs require incredibly powerful magnetic fields, and in order to generate those fields, you need materials with extremely low or zero resistance. And as a result, at the heart of every MRI is a superconductor. That's a multi-billion-dollar technology that saved countless lives. But did Kamerling Onis have any idea what the impact of his work would be? He was just trying to push the boundary of discovery, find out what happens at the lowest possible temperatures. By the way, where else can we be sure to find superconductors? The Large Hadron Collider. In order to guide those protons around that ring, you need again a very strong magnetic field, and as a result, superconductors in those magnets. So it's beautifully symbiotic. Discovery feeds technology. Technology feeds discovery. Can't have one without the other. But the superconductivity story is far from over because we have no idea. How these things work at warmer temperatures, and we need to understand this. These are some of the warm, warmest superconductors ever discovered. Incredibly complex materials. You don't just stumble across those things. You need theory to tell you where to look. And here again, the holographic principle is stepping in. I don't have time to explain the details, but here's the picture roughly. If we go back to our cylinder and we cool the temperature down, remember that means shrinking the black hole. Eventually, we see that an atmosphere starts to form around the black hole. And if we open up our dictionary and figure out what that atmosphere corresponds to, it corresponds to a superconducting gas. So this has the potential to describe warmer superconductors. So the potential for this kind of duality is really virtually endless. It's not just for understanding the nature of the universe, but it's for building technology as well. And though the gap between funda fundamental physics and technology takes time to cross, we always cross it, and there's a reason for that. It's that everything in the universe, even things that appear to live in completely different worlds, obey the same fundamental laws of nature. The fact that by understanding the space around a black hole, we may someday improve our electrical wiring is really a testament to the universality of physical law. <laughs>
So, to answer my aunt's initial question, maybe an analogy is best. Our species is groping around in this big, dark room, trying to feel out all the furniture to figure out where it is, so we can stop bumping into it. But when we do fundamental physics, we're at the edge of the room, hugging the walls. And it might look like we're just trying to stay away from all the sharp corners inside, but really, we're just looking for a light switch. So when you hear about these kinds of discoveries on the frontier of science, on the boundary of human knowledge, remember that even though they might appear distant and abstract, all of our lives and all of this world are on the boundary too. Thank you.